What are you net? 102. Nice. $102,000. I want to hear the thousand. How much did you make? $102,000. How did that feel? Crazy. Unreal. All right. Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your host, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And we are excited today. Today's episode, our Fearless Future podcast, is filled with uh, some cool stuff and some new stuff. So I wanted to make sure we do our Gen X moment to get started because we like talking to our Gen X crowd because we are Gen Xers. But also, we have a very exciting interview with the Kings today. Yes, I'm excited to talk to them. Yeah, so we're looking forward. They are very successful students of ours who just completed their first $100,000 profit flip. Yeah, we are so proud of them. They've been killing it. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we're also going to introduce a new segment today called Stupid Human Comments. <laughs> Keeping it fresh. Stupid Human Comments. If you were a Dave Letterman fan back in the day, he had stupid human tricks. He used to have people come on. Do you remember those? I do. He had the people come on and do the dumbest things on his podcast. And, it, and it's Gen his... Xers that'll know who David Letterman is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that is true. I can't believe he's uh, yeah, not. Yeah, now he's just a weird looking guy with a big, long Santa beard. Yes. Right? It's crazy looking. But yeah, so I'm excited about today's episode. It should be uh, should be good. We've been recording a lot of content and stuff today, so I'm excited to to jump into it. So look, the Gen X moment day, I've been thinking a lot about Evil Knievel. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember Evil Knievel growing oh, up. Oh, I totally remember Evil Knievel. Yeah. I so, remember my brothers being on their bikes in the backyard, like making ramps and doing crazy. You know what? One time I think a friend of mine had a pool in the backyard and they would put their bikes <laughs> up on the roof I did, and yeah. they would ride their bikes off of the roof into this woman. Pool, nice. I don't, whole think, evil can evil I don't think I ever did that. Well, I was wondering, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and I was, I was saying, you know, my kids never built ramps and jumped their bikes. Like that was a thing when oh, I was yeah. a kid, like the higher the ramp off of a hill in my backyard. Crazy. I had more, you know, I didn't break any bones, but lots of, you know, I'm sure now that's why I ache so much just from constantly yeah. getting beat up and, mangled my old Schwinn bike or whatever. And I remember that growing up. And I said, I was thinking about that. And I thought to myself, I think a lot of us were influenced in that day and age back in the 70s and 80s by Evil Knievel. Oh, yeah, for sure. He he died, didn't he? I, I looked it up yesterday. He died. Um, He had died here in Clearwater, actually. Oh, like okay. 30 minutes from us. He was 69 years old. I didn't realize how old he was, though. He was born in 38. He That boy had to be hurting. Yeah. He had to. I mean, the, he died the, of pulmonary disease. The, <laughs> I'm sure his organs were just like rattled uh, like they were in cages you oh, know? they had to be horrible yeah it had to be a rough uh, rough thing so yeah so I, that was my that was my gen x moment i wanted to discuss today was the uh, good old evil knievel because my friends and i we spent a lot of time jumping those bikes over the years and i want to thank and pay homage to evil knievel yeah he was cool he was uh, he was a cool dude he did a lot of crazy stuff man he was and, uh, and that was before social media you know some, that was he, oh, like yeah, that he, was before any of this you know yeah. modern day well, he stuff was, that he could like promote himself on. Like he was, he was famous. He made national TV. I mean, there were many, oh, yeah. I think when he jumped, he jumped a section of the Grand Canyon. Yep. He, that man had balls of steel. The I Vegas, mean, he, he did just, something big in Vegas. Oh yeah. yeah, he did. How he did that stuff and didn't kill himself was beyond me. I so. forgot what it said about how many bones he had broken and I, he got severe the injuries. The rumor was every bone in his body, but I'm sure that was an exaggeration, but maybe it wasn't because he definitely got, you ever watch some of those when he would land on, I think he jumped buses one time and he hit the ramp after and just smashed, went into a whole, like a puddle of bones. Oh, it was terrible. So anyways, but anyways, moving along. So listen, I, uh, I think we should bring the Kings on and talk to them. Let's you think do so? It. Cause I, I want to introduce them properly first. So we met the Kings through a virtual home flipping workshop that we did. We had to go virtual back in during COVID during COVID. 21. And they were actually, ironically, they were not far from where we lived in right. upstate New York. And so they were, uh, and I knew. We had never I, met them before. No, nope. And uh, they came to a virtual workshop. He's an associate pastor. And I believe that Alicia was a stay-at-home mom. Yeah, homeschooling their homeschooling kids. Homeschooling their kids. Yeah, full-time job with that. And then they came to the workshop and it was a, it was a big stretch for them to get started as real estate investors. Because, yeah. you know, pastors don't make a lot of money. That's right. just a, that's a known thing. They're, they're there for the purpose of what they're doing that they're not that's what drives them it's yeah. not they're not there for the money right you right. don't you don't say i want to become a pastor so i can become rich and wealthy right but you need finances to have a great life and take care of your family and all that stuff so they wanted to find a way to supplement so they could do what they love to do without putting a burden on their church and all that so right. so they came in and got started and you know we did a show with them you can find it on youtube the called flip and break yeah the big flipping break we there was a whole bunch of contestants and we ended up choosing them and we actually uh, partnered on a deal with them. 
right? And what was the premise of the show? I forgot. We had all those people. We had like we had like 300 people interview or uh, or apply for it. Right. Send in videos and all that. About why they would be good candidates, why they deserved it, whatnot. Yeah. And yeah. then so we ended up picking Dave and Alicia, I think because they kind of reminded us of us. You know, yeah. it was a husband and wife team. Um, their their values. The husband was very good looking. That's what reminded <laughs> me. If he reminds me of us. So, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think we we said, though, like two brains are better than one. You know, when you're doing yeah. this, especially if you're doing it as a side hustle, you have, you know, double the efforts. And yeah, and we loved their mission. You know, their they their values are really, really important to them. Their family life. That's why yeah. Alicia was a stay at home mom and homeschooled the kids. And then they're also, you know, their ministry is really, really important to them. Yeah. And I think we just thought that they would do a good job, like they yeah. would they would be a good fit. Yeah. So I was excited when we brought them on. We did the show and we we made like 40 grand that first day and we split it. And then we uh, we funded a few deals for them after that. And they they went off on their own way and they have they have just been crushing it. I'm going to let them say what they've been doing since then. But I want to hear about this deal where they just made one hundred thousand dollars. I'm so excited. So I want to find. So let's bring on David and Alicia King. Let's see if we can get them on with us. Guys, are you there? Hey, how are you guys doing? There you are. Hey, hey y'all. Good. Good. How are you? Good. We're doing good. Great to see you. Yeah, you, you too. too. We just gave you guys a great introduction. We talked about how good looking you were, David, because Amber said it's you reminded you guys reminded us of, oh, yeah. of thank you. You reminded thank you, thank us you. of us. So yeah. And Alicia is equally as beautiful. She is. I just I, she Aww, gets a, she gets a lot of props. I just want to give David some props. And there. smart, super smart. <laughs> oh yeah. For sure. No, there you guys are a great team. So listen, I want to hear about this latest deal. You guys just closed a deal where you made a hundred thousand dollars in profit on one deal. Am I correct? That is we correct. Did. I want to hear about I think listeners always want to hear, like, I want to I want to dissect the deal a little bit, if that's okay, yeah. and kind of find out some things yeah. about it. So first off, how did you find it? How did you because everybody says I can't find deals, I can't find you know, we hear that a lot. And you're like, well, you're just not looking. How did okay. you find that deal? So this one was actually um two different ways. We had sent out a mailer, and um then a friend of ours had actually seen the house and like drove by it and told us about it. So it was a referral. So let me ask you so a question. This, how how did your friend know it was for sale? Was there a for sale sign? Oh, no, for, no, we had we had a uh, kind of coached him along saying, Hey, look for long grass, look for like, you know, yeah. mails in the, you know, stuffed in the mailbox type of thing. Uh, not many people driving by it. It's like, you know, not many people there. He noticed long grass and uh, a town notice in, right. in the window. Um, and told Gee, where did you, that. where did you ever learn that technique from? Oh, I, don't I don't know. I mean, it might have been a workshop. Yeah, <laughs> you know what, though, guys? I, I want to commend you on this because you didn't just go driving for dollars yourself. You actually right. employed your friends and family to do it. Yeah. So, right. you know, like, like right. you know, you can't be everywhere at once, but you have to let people know what you're doing. So right. it was on top of So they saw the house. So you had that. And then you also did a mailer. Just out of curiosity, how many mailers did you send out? So you did it with a postcards, the letters. What did you send out? So that one was letters and what did we do? 5,000 pieces. 5,000 pieces and uh, once for three months. Right. Okay. So three so different It cost times. you a few thousand bucks for marketing to find that particular deal, but you have other deals, I'm sure, from that same thing. But that from that deal, you right. did that. So I think people want to understand, like, where do you find those deals from? So it was driving for dollars. So again, a lot of times in marketing, depending on what you're doing, it might take a person multiple touches to call you or to reach out to you did they reach out to you via the mailer so i had reached out to one of the brothers and talked to him and then it was a it was actually a year later when you know they reached out to us a from year the later a year later i yeah. got so that's a that's a huge part of the story i did not know yeah. so people have to understand you have to yeah. stay in the game once you start planting seeds You've got oh, yeah. to stay in the game to water those yes. seeds. People, people are like, "Oh, I, I talked to somebody. I didn't find a house." You're like, "You got to stick with it because people, people sell when yep. they're ready, not when not, not when we're ready, right?" Right. right. So yeah, yeah that, that's one of the biggest things people always ask us: How do you find the deals? How do you find the deals? I just can't find any. Like our main answer is, we're in the game. Yeah, like, you gotta be. Looking. You can't win the lottery right. if you don't play. Yeah. You know, you have to be in the game, and sometimes that game is a long game. And I remember, Amber, you telling me that a while back too, that exact thing. Like if I'm not making the offers, if I'm not like actually in the game, right. Yeah. I'm not going to get the deal. Not gonna do so. It. so you guys find the deal and then you negotiate with the guy. What did you buy the house for? That house we bought for 90,000. 90, uh, 
straight up deal with private lender fund? Like, how did you fund? How did you fund it? Was it a straight up deal? Was it a creative finance deal? What did you do there? Uh, th this one was a straight up cash deal with a private investor. Um, so it wasn't any subject to or any joint venture. Yep. That you, you've done in the past. You've done those that you right. learned when working with us, but all that. But yeah. So what were the negotiations like? Like, what did you start at? And then you ended on 90. But what did you start at? This one, we started at 90, ended at 90. Yeah. Okay. You're a tough it's negotiator, David. Was, yeah, you're a tough. Was, I know. It, I was know. A, it was a good conversation. We had a good connection with the seller and, you know, just were able to to talk about um, he had had a struggle with a couple of contractors because they were actually going to renovate the house themselves. And then they were out of state and, you know, just we wanted to help them. They wanted to help us kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm and the numbers were. So, I'm but at that that being said, our Mayo for it was like one ten. Okay, that was my next question. When you use the home building yeah. evaluator, yeah. what was your Mayo? So, so your your Mayo was one ten, and well, you got it for let's ninety. Let's describe what Mayo is, because listeners are going, "What the heck is Mayo? Yep. Are they making a sandwich?" So <laughs> Mayo stands for M A O, stands for maximum allowable offer. We have a calculation we use. We teach our students to say, "Okay, you know, what is the maximum you can pay for this house and be profitable." And cover all your expenses. And so the the most you could have paid was 110, but you paid 90. I'm proud of you for that. Yes. That's very good. So you pay 90. That, you, that's a twenty thousand dollar profit that you put in your pocket by offering less than your mayo. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys did a what what kind of work was needed? Was it cosmetic mainly? Was it anything major? It was it, everything. Everything. <laughs> it was all down to the studs. Oh, all down to the studs. Oh, big one. You, okay. you did you have to tear it down to the studs or was it studs when you bought it? Studs when we bought it. It was all so all they started and got overwhelmed. Correct. Okay. Nice. Nice. Okay. They're so like, we bit off more than we can chew. Yeah. <laughs> Let's so then get rid you, of this. you came in. You came in as the heroes. It was a big project, so I would, you know, it could intimidate people. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys did a full renovation. You hired all the contractors, right? Yep. yep. Didn't do any work yourself. I mean, labor work. Yeah. No, he changed the hinges one night. Yeah. David. But, you know, we Not talk about bad. this stuff, David. He, like, he <laughs> likes to do some manual. I know he likes to fiddle. He likes to fiddle. Don't so, be fiddling. Yeah. So, but this is a, this is an example of a motivated seller. They got in over their head. They thought they wanted to do it, and then they get it down to the studs and realize, yep. whoa, this is a lot more work than I than I thought. Was it was an estate sale. Like, had they inherited uh, the house? You said yeah. you talked to a brother. Yeah, yeah. The okay. parent, they, that was the house that they grew up in. Okay. Um, and it was their parents, his uh, grandfather and his father actually built the house. Okay, so there's one motivating factor. You've heard in other episodes of the podcast, we've talked about how to find the motivated sellers. And then also the more you can stack those different motivated sellers, the more, you know, yeah. Beneficial it is to, well, to they get, had to get out of the house. I'm sure they had holding costs that were they, they were paying the taxes, taxes they're paying, they're paying the expenses on that thing. Plus the now they have a, now they have a vacant house. Right. Another complete right. vacant house, which is a that's a disaster. And if they gutted itself. it, they couldn't even sell it like no. that because nobody would be able to get a loan for it. Right. Yeah. So hold right. it. So you guys fix the house. How long did it take you? Three months, like 10 weeks. So two and a half. OK. Two and yeah. a half months. That's, up, that's so good for a good job. Ended, yeah, it was it was pretty good. The only thing is, so we ended up buying the house mid-December and then we thought we were going to be able to get right in. But. We had drawn up plans. They weren't blueprints. They weren't stamped or anything. We drew up plans and took them to the town. And the town was like, oh, no. So okay. now let, me, let me ask you, you, you say you yeah. drew up plans. You drew them up yourself or you had them drawn up by an engineer? No, we drew them up ourselves. Okay. We just like, you know. Yeah, you, that, that's what you want to see. Plan, which sometimes you can get away with depending on the town and depending on the extent of the work. Sure. Right. That's what I had heard, but he was like, no, <laughs> we wanted, okay. we wanted to put an addition, like, um, we wanted to build up into the attic area and actually open it up and have, um, an upstairs, like two bedrooms and a bathroom up there. So then he told us that we needed to get professional blueprints and have them stamped and all of that. So that process took about four weeks. Okay. By the time we got into the house, it was almost end of January because we're on Christmas, you know, so we're end of January, beginning of February. We started February and then we finished in April, February, March, April. Yeah. So I think it took 10 weeks with our contractors 
Okay. But then we also had like four weeks waiting. So this the- flip wasn't, I mean, this was not cosmetic. This was a gut job. So you walked into a gutted house. So you had to do probably electrical and everything else, plumbing, probably. There's probably a lot of things you had to do in there, right? Sheet Eating, rock. HVAC, yeah. All of it, which is a great learning experience. Yeah. But now this, th- what number flip was this for you? This was number nine. nine. Number nine. So, so you were ready to take on a full-blown gut job. I mean, you were ready to say, okay, I'm going to... No, still apprehensive, but yeah, sure. I guess ready. Yeah. Well, I think you were ready. You did, you did pretty well on it. So I want to hear about that. So, yeah, then, so then you, I'm thinking to myself, you, you had to go get plans for that, which, which delayed the house a month. So that cost you money because you had to pay a few grand, I'm sure for blueprints you weren't expecting. Right. And then holding you, costs. you had holding costs for an extra month. You weren't expecting in the middle of winter, which I guess there was no heater. So you didn't have to worry about the heater part, but there's still right, holding yeah. costs. And I think that what people don't understand is that during that time, because you went 20,000 less than Mayo, your maximum allowable offer, that right. that gave you the cushion for that little several thousand dollar hiccup, hiccup. Yeah. Right? right? People forget that when yeah. they say, I'll pay the most I can pay. Well, you have to cover yourself for mistakes, right? So you guys did that. So you get all done with the property and did it go relatively smoothly for, for you haven't mentioned anything bad yet. Did anything bad happen besides the blueprint? So this one, it was mainly the blueprint just getting started. After that, I mean, it did it did go rather smoothly. Well, sometimes that happens. Surprising. And, uh-huh. and, and that's because you put a plan in place. Like, Alicia, I know how good you are at making sure that you have all your I's dotted and T's crossed. You get that scope of work done mm-hmm. so that the contractors know what they need to do. And they're not asking you a million questions throughout the job. Like, like talk about that for a minute. How did, like, the job yeah. went smoothly. What would you attribute that to? Right. So I think using the same contractor. So, um, you know, as you taught us to be able to vet contractors and things like that. And this contractor was actually one that you had helped us, you know, find, which was great. Um, But being able to use the scope of work and just have a detailed plan. He also knows the way that I like things to look. So I think over time, just developing that relationship has been so helpful. So for this house, it was less phone calls. It was less things that he had questions about. It was, you know, so I think that that definitely helped. Okay, I got to ask you a side question because something came up a while ago in one of our previous episodes, it came up when Amber was talking about women. Is this the same, con- we don't have to mention the name, but is this the same contractor that calls you honey or baby or something like that one time? Same one? Dear, dear, yeah. Dear. dear. Yes. And, and what, what, what did you say to him? Um, I just informed him that he did not have the right to call me dear. And, you know, we were in a business relationship and, you know, yeah. I love it. I love it. That, that came up in a previous podcast about uh, strong women investors. So that's pretty good. So oh, yeah. I, wait, she said, Alicia, Alicia said, uh, I'm not your dear. Like, I'm not you don't your get dear. to call me that. So. I'm not your dear. <laughs> I'm David's dear and that's going to be it. And even that exactly. sometimes, I'm not always his dear, just most of the time. So but, but, he, but he does need to know how to say yes, dear. Yeah, yeah. He knows how to say that for sure. So, all right. So tell us, you sell, you, happy life. Well, yeah, that's very true, David. Happy, yeah, happy wife, happy life. So, yeah, Amber had a little bit of a spat yesterday. You guys would have liked that. We were, we had a little bit of a, uh-huh. a little bit of a moment yesterday. So, yeah, but we, we're past it. it. You're stronger. We're yeah. past it. So, there you go. I just said I was sorry for whatever I did wrong. So, anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> it makes life easier that way. So, anyways, so you sell the house. And how, so you, you bought the house for 90. What did you all, what, what are you all in for? What did you, what were you all in? All in, we were 125, which was more than what we had originally thought we were planning on 110. Um, so that's the other thing. Like when you, when you taught us to like have the maximum offer after multiple houses, we've learned because we used to be right at our, our maximum offer. Yeah. And, you know, we want to be able to pay as much, you know, whatever. But yeah. we've learned you want to kind of give yourself that cushion of like the $20,000. So your $125,000 renovation, that that budget was more than you paid for the house. So people can reference that. You paid ninety for the house and one hundred and twenty five for renovations, right? That's that's when yeah. you know you've got a big renovation going on, when your renovation budget right. is, is 30% more than you paid for the yeah. house. So you yeah. sell the house. Are you Do you sell it first weekend? Does it take three months? Well, how does it work? So, so we put the house on the market Thursday and um, our realtor has been kind of analyzing all of our deals and he is like, okay, 
I think we're going to price this house a lot below what we actually want to get. So we priced the house at 299 thinking, oh my goodness, well, we have to get 325 So let's just hope we get 325 And um, that night, I think we had 10 showings. Friday was jam-packed. By Saturday, offers were coming in. We had 12? Yeah, at the end, at the end of the we had 12 offers. offers. 12 offers. <laughs> 12 but, offers I mean, over, over asking, I'm assuming. Over asking, yes. Yeah, yep, we were... 65 over asking. Yeah. I think. Yeah, the, the offer that we accepted was 65 over asking. Yeah. The we did have one that was a little bit over that, but this offer was better with all the other all stuff, the terms, yep. the terms yeah. and everything. Yep. Yeah. So yep. all said and done now, what'd you sell the house for? 365. 365. 365. You're asking 299.9, I'm assuming, and then you and then you sold it for 365,000. So when all is all done. Everybody paid. Your private investor paid. Contractors paid. All the holding costs. All, all the that holding stuff. costs. Everything. What do you know? Lawyers paid. Lawyers paid. One hundred and two. Nice. One hundred and two thousand dollars. I want to hear the thousand. How much did you make? One hundred and two thousand dollars. How did that feel? Crazy. Unreal. <laughs> I remember Glenn saying in one of our calls. Um, Oh, we're waiting for you to make a hundred thousand on a house. And I just remember thinking, how would that ever be possible? But <laughs> oh, we're, we're, like, we're like 50, 50. I'm like, 40 is great. <laughs> I was thinking 50. So, so oh. what does that do for your family? Oh my goodness. Well, even like our daughter's in college right now. And a few years ago, we were trying to think like, how can we help her out? Like even to pay for half of it, like, what can we do to make this work? And now we're going to be able to like write her a check for half of college. Like it's just insane. That's so even, insane. even on top of that, um, for, you know, I'm in, I'm in the ministry, yeah. uh, giving back to our, our church. Um, last year I was, I was able to, to write a large, large couple checks and that I thought were large. Um, well, they were large. Like, yeah, they're yeah, they're now they're going to be <laughs> larger, aren't they? Yes, you know. Right, but then comes this oh. one deal, and I'm like, You're like right, "Oh my I'm, goodness!" <laughs> I'm able to to basically complete all of last year in almost one one check. And David, you 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 and Alicia will be you'll be tithing back to your church more than you get paid soon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think Wait, about that. that be awesome, though. How yes. cool is that? Um, that's yes. just, that's just on the time you get back. So I'm, I'm, I know that you had shared me before that you, you know, you were well in the six figures and this year is just starting, you know, and you were already well in the six figures with your earnings. And I was so proud of you guys. And I just, what, what did you, I, I want to talk about one more deal, but I want to ask you this question first, and then I want to do stupid human comment. And then I want to, I want to, I want to talk about a deal that we help you implement um, with negotiation, okay. but where are you guys at? So you've been with us for about three years, right? You joined Vester Pro about three years uh, four, yeah. has it been four, end three of, and a half? End of 2020. So. End of 2020. So we're okay. three years, three, a little over three and a half, something yeah. like that. And in that yeah. time, how many deals have you done between rentals and flips and wholesale, whatever else you've done? How many deals in total have you done? Nine. Nine so, deals that you've yeah. done. And you, you have more in the hopper. Don't you have more going on right now? Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We have one that we're under contract on and then another so that's one number that 10. So that's 10 yeah. deals. So so let me ask this question. How much have you made if you if you calculate equity, flip profits, and even this number 10 that you have in there, do a do a conservative estimate on what you're gonna make on that one. I want to know on these 10 deals what you've made. Yeah, totaled up. Um well, just just on flips, we're at like six hundred thousand. No, so ju not. just on flips no. is six hundred thousand. Now, 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 how much in the equity do you have? No, no, no. I'm being no, corrected. No, no, no. I'm being so corrected. I think I think we're about like for all of them about six hundred. About and that, so inclu that's that includes the, the rentals. On the two rentals. Yep, and then so we have a hundred thousand equity on both rental, and then about four hundred on flips because we just did that hundred thousand in three and a half years. You guys have done this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys understand I, how powerful that is? Do you understand what a life changing thing that is? Before we let you go today, I want to do our stupid human uh, segment right now. Before I go, I want you to be thinking about what your fearless future looks like, because I want to hear from you what that looks like to you. So so we did an episode not too long ago on squatters. Yes. 
and we had all kinds of comments. And that got people all kind of riled up. Some of the some of the the oh, shorter man. reels had 10, 10 or fifteen thousand views, which is a lot for us. And it was crazy about squatters, and yeah. I couldn't believe it was such a thing. So a squatter is someone that just stays in a house that's not their house, and so and they have rights <laughs> in a lot of states, a lot of blue states, especially in New York, where our rentals are. If you don't deal with them for 30 days, they pretty much get to take over your house yeah. for months and months, if not a year or more on end. So lots of comments came in. What was the comment we had on the squatter? So there's two here. What's so the first one, the, the first one is it's illegal to own more than one house. It's the law. OK, like, so apparently that person knows the law. So they can't you're not allowed. To, yeah. Right, David. I get it. Right. So, yeah, that that was that stupid human comment. So I mean, it's against the law to own more than one house. It's illegal to own more than one house, oh, comma, space, space, the law. Like, yeah, like, OK, number one, you're not even using proper English. But number two, like, clearly, that's not illegal. Yeah. Like, where on earth did All you right. get that information? That was so from? stupid. I don't even we're doing doesn't dignify a response. What's the next? All one? right. So oh this, this one. Uh, oh, and that came from UFO dot architect. What a shocker. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just looking at like who they're from. That's UFO, almost just as humorous. UFO. Yeah. OK, so solid, solid. Th this next one comes from Flingle underscore dingus. <laughs> so. Again, sounds very intelligent. <laughs> All right. So this one, get this. So being landlords, you guys can comment on this as well. To be honest, if a landlord is rich enough to pay taxes on a home that he doesn't rent to anyone and hasn't for a while, what's the point in him keeping the property? If anything, squatters help people like that. Does that make any sense to you guys? How, I don't understand what's happened to the decay of our society, society. that people think if you don't own a, if you don't have it rented, that it just becomes theirs. It yeah. should not be ours if we can't keep a house rented. Mind you, there might be problems with the house. It might not be able to be rented. There may be a family out of state. There could be so many outside circumstances. I mean... <laughs> Like you said, I feel like it doesn't even warrant responses. Like, I, know, yeah. I mean, somebody owns it. They're paying for it. They, why would somebody it, else but... be able to just, I don't know. I don't have any idea where people get their information or why they think it's okay. They, there were a yeah. lot of comments in this, uh, after that episode on squatters, um, there was a lot of comments about how that's, you know, we're, we're too rich. If we have that many houses, well, we're just too rich. And they, and we deserve, we, we don't, we don't deserve to have that many houses. Really? So, no you know, never, so never mind. You, we're providing housing for people that need it. Yeah. Anyway. Right. Yeah. It's so just great. Like the comments are just crazy. I think one person like replied to that and was like, so if you have a car sitting in, in your driveway and you haven't driven it for a month, does that make it okay to just like go steal their car? <laughs> I'm sure UFO boy thinks it's that's what he should be doing. Or dingus. That's what they probably think they should I be mean, doing. It's so. crazy. Anyway. Like, stupid human <laughs> comments. All right. Anyway, so back to you guys. I as long as we're talking about rentals, you guys, out of the six hundred thousand dollars in wealth you've already created for yourself, income and wealth, two hundred thousand of that is tied up in two rental properties, right? You know, right. as you guys know, one of the things that separates us from everybody else out there is that we do implementation. Like we don't just coach. We actually implement and say, listen, let's help you make these phone calls together. Let's do it together. And we try to do that to remove some of the fear from the whole process to make people, again, fearless future means if we can remove some fear, it's a fearless future for people. So yeah. I'd like you to tell the story, David, about when we, uh, you and I together negotiated your first rental and how you were going to pay a hundred and then through some mm -hmm. quick negotiating and, and training, what happened there? Let's talk about that quick. I just want to throw that number out there. So, people I, know. so I had, um, Forget how I got a hold of of the. I think that was a mailer. That was a mailer. Yeah. Okay, that was our first mailer that we had sent out. Yeah. Um, and he had called and had this house that he had inherited and had been renting out for like twenty years. Uh, he was just tired. He was already down in Florida, you know, living it up, and uh, just wanted to get rid of it. Was tired of dealing with the the tenants that were were in there. Um. And I ran my numbers, and my numbers were solid at a hundred thousand. That was your mail. Um, you said I can pay a hundred thousand dollars for this house. Yeah, you called them up and you said, "I'll give you, I'll give you, I can give you a hundred hundred thousand for it. Um, just you know, need to go see it, you yeah. know, and uh, take a look at it." And then, then you called me, was, and then I called you, and I said, yeah. "Nah." We're not paying a hundred thousand for that house. No way in the world. Because you, because it was sight unseen. It was sight unseen. Time, yeah. 
So I had, right. we had, I, we yeah. had issues. We couldn't get into the house. We couldn't see it. Yeah. We, and I remember Glenn telling you, you can't buy the house sight unseen and offer that much. You don't know if there's going to be problems that, that are in there. It, that It could, could be a full on meth lab right. in there. You have no, you had no, and they lived there for 20 or 25 years. I think it was right. It was a crazy amount of time right. they had been there for. So we had to do that. So you and I got on the phone together and started going over how to handle this negotiation. Right. And long, long story short, what happened? Uh, long story short, uh, after we talked and uh, we actually did some role playing of yep. talking on the phone, you that. pretending to be the seller, uh, yep. I was able to get the house for 65000 Do you remember? Wait, before we say that, so you got the house <laughs> for six, but Do you remember like we, we role played back and forth? You were all nervous. And I said, let's call him now. And you're like, no. Now? Uh, <laughs> no? I said, Are you sure? This is implementation, Sorry. coach, and this is not, this is not, we hope to do something in the future. We're going to do this now, man. This is, let's rock and roll yeah. and do this. And so you made, made the phone call and he went from 100 down, we, 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 we role played you offering 50 and you guys settled at, say it again. We settled at, we settled at 65,000. Yeah. $35,000 yeah. different. Right. So I want, I want David to say, so how many, how much money did that one phone call, that implementation coaching call, how much did that one call make you? That one coaching phone call made us $35,000. That's awesome. That's that amazing. Incredible. That's awesome. So, well, listen, we are really proud of you guys. You guys have killed it this year, this past three and a half years. You, and you, um, you know what I think is funny, though, what? as David, as you're telling that story, you said you said the the owner of that house was down in Florida living it up. Is that what people think of people that live in Florida? We're just like living it up all the time. <laughs> don't be, don't I mean, be bitter. Got the beautiful weather. We're over here freezing still. And <laughs> hey, I, I like it. I think it's great you that know. people think that we're just living it up. Tell uh, tell everybody as we as we let you guys go here today. Tell everybody what your fearless future looks like. You guys, I'm sure, have had those quiet moments where you've discussed it. If you wouldn't mind sharing with people, knowing what you know now, after you're in your tenth deal, three and a half years in with Vester Pro and with Amber and I and our whole family. I guess one off, did you find us to be helpful? And do you think you'd have been as far without us? I'm curious of that first. And I want to hear about your fearless future. We were just talking about this. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine and she's like, you, you have to pay so much into groups like this. And I said, do you think that we would be as far along as we are without our network? Yeah. I said, there's, there's no way. Like, that one rental that we struggled with in the beginning. Like, I mean, I probably would have walked away at that point, but just being encouraged and also just not even just, just the encouragement, but like, no, go do this or go do that. You know, just yeah. giving guidance along the way. I yeah. we absolutely all, would not be where we all are. those, all those tools yeah. that we were able to implement uh, into our business, into our life. Yeah. Um, and the, the part that we, we had to do was we had to implement them. Right. You, yeah. you gave us the tools, the, the resources, the network, uh, and then we took them and, and went, went for it. Well, you guys have been amazing. What's your fearless future look like? Um, our fearless future for us is, uh, just being able to, to give back to our community, um, uh, and, uh, build that wealth and safety net for, for our family, um, to en enjoy, enjoy life and, and do what we, we want to do. Awesome. When when you guys started this, did you ever dream that this could happen? Like, did you ever picture this? So I struggle with dreams, <laughs> but he does well with that. So I'm like, a, I'm going to put the plans into place. But then he's like, oh, it could be this. And I was like, I don't know, babe. <laughs> but I don't know. I think you might have. Yeah, I, I, I dreamed about it, but... Was it reality? You know? Right. I... I, I I dream about it and I say, okay, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, well, I, I shot for it and I, I missed a little bit and well, I did better than where I was. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one more thing before we finalize, finalize up with them. So, you know, Vesterpro is not a female only company, but we do have a Vesterpro women division. Yeah. So Alicia, if you don't mind just talking for a minute about being a female real estate investor and how that's affected your life as, as a stay at home mom and, and also somebody that's homeschooling your kids and, you know, how has that affected your family life and, and being able to contribute to the family? Um, I love the fact that we can actually make an income and I don't always have to leave my house for hours a day. Like I can be at my kitchen table or our island and homeschool my children 
and spend that time doing it. But then I can take them and I can run to a flip and check up on something, but then I can come back home and I can go swimming with them. Like the schedule I think has been one of my favorite things because we were looking for, for a side gig and it's like, okay, this demands this amount of hours, this demands, but as you continue to, to build your team, as you've taught us and, you know, you see that, okay, I don't actually have to be there. Like somebody else can be there for me or, you know, I can teach them how to do this so that they don't need me. <laughs> That's awesome. And your kids are all getting to see amazing examples out of both of you guys. Yeah. You know, they're going to, they're seeing their mom and dad have a goal and a dream and work toward it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we're very proud of you guys and uh, just keep, uh, keep kicking butt and taking names up there in New York and uh, keep doing it. We're really proud of you guys. So, so it, I mean, here, here, here's six hundred thousand dollars. That's, that's life changing. That's life changing money to anybody. I don't care who you are. So that's fantastic. So. You're an inspiration. Um, Amber, I just want to show you one thing because you said that about my kids. So my oldest was saying something like maybe a year into when we had started, and I said, "Well, you know, because we're looking for houses and we're going to flip them and things like that." She's like, "Mom, it's been a year and you've only found one house." And I kind of like, oh my goodness. Um, Lights and fire. I that and I prayed about it. And I was just like, okay, we're going to do whatever it takes to show our kids oh. that we can be successful in this. And my little guy cut me out houses. They're going to fall, but they're little paper houses. Oh, and he that. cut me out seven of them. That's and amazing. he goes, mommy, this is the seven houses that you're going to do. And I looked at them thinking, how am I ever going to get to do seven houses? <laughs> Here you are at number that 10. That was awesome. That gave me goosebumps. Yeah, that was fantastic. And I keep them in my phone. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's and you special. Know, and I wonder why he picked the number seven too, because I know you guys are, are very much in the ministry and the number seven has a lot well, to do with them. Um, it really does. Yeah. It's the number of completion. And it's just, you know, just keep going. Keep wow. going. That's awesome. Gosh, yeah. I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't say anything better. You guys are fantastic. Yep. We love you guys. Keep it up. Keep doing it. You're doing great. <laughs> Bye, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, my Bye -bye. gosh. Gosh, we love those guys. I know. What, what an inspirational awesome. story. And uh, I never heard that story about Josiah and what, no. he, what he gave mom. He popped seven. on a lot of our calls that he we does. do with him. Yeah. He does. So we, we got to know them because we helped them implement so many things yeah. around the early days. And I look back and realize that's why we're that's why we're pushing so hard on implementation now and helping people really get started because the faster we get them off to a good start. That's our whole new, our whole program yeah. is the faster we get you under contract, the faster we get your house flipped or wholesale, whatever it is, the faster we can get you going, the faster you believe it happens for you. And like they said, they only had one house done in their first year, but now they're three years in there on number 10, yeah. $600,000 later. And this is a, this is an associate pastor and a stay-at-home yeah. mom. And this is, this is just that, I tell you, every time, every time we have struggles in business and I think about Vestor Pro and, you know, it's a business, we have ups, we have downs, there's, there's stuff you deal with employees and whatnot and 401ks or not 401k but investment pro all these different things we do as a business i hear those stories and i'm like this is why we do it yeah exactly this 100%. is why we do it i like so, i feel like i live vicariously through other people's success stories because you know for us it's a day in the life of like you know we we make that kind of profit and it's like okay that's great yeah. but one of our students makes it and yeah. it's like oh my goodness this is amazing and then yeah. you know we've talked a lot recently about how there's no risk in education yeah but there is risk in implementation so right. when you have a coach that's actually holding your hand and walking you through implementing exactly doing, what doing you need to do, with you. Yeah. doing calls with you, yeah. negotiating with you, helping you find yeah. the right contractor and how to interview them. It, like when you have somebody doing that with you and implementing with you, that is a game changer. Imagine how much faster we'd have went along oh, back yeah. in the day if we had someone helping us and we had probably to probably save it out. hundreds of thousands oh, of dollars making mistakes. mistakes along yeah, the way, for you know? Sure, so. Well, gosh, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed today's podcast. It's very special having our guests on here and hope you enjoyed everything that we did. And, uh, I guess that is it until our next episode. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked what you heard here today, make sure you click that like button and make sure you also subscribe and click on notifications so you don't miss the next stupid human comment segment of our episode.